Now to Capitol Hill for a hearing on how federal, state, and local health agencies are sharing information about possible bioterrorist attacks. Testifying today, officials from the Centers for Disease Control and the National Center for Infectious Diseases, as well as some local health officials. The hearing is just over two hours. control and prevention uh, here and after the CDC uh, for responding to a bioterrorism threat. This hearing will review uh, the CDC's March 2001 report on public health infrastructure, every health department fully prepared, every community better protected. The best initial defense against public health threats, whether naturally occurring or deliberately caused, continues to be accurate, timely uh, recognition and reporting of problems. To that end, one of our top priorities must be to ensure we have a strong information sharing network that protects privacy while seamlessly connecting local, state, and federal governments. Moreover, timely and easy access to information is key to applying effective countermeasures. However, the CDC report noted serious deficiencies in the timely distribution of information between federal, state, and local governments in response to critical public health threat. The March 2001 report outlined a number of goals for improving communication and information technology capabilities at the federal, state, and local level. The hearing today will examine our progress to date in meeting the goals set forth in that report and the time frames for reaching our as yet unmet goals. Additionally, it will discuss lessons learned from the recent events related to the anthrax incidents in October and November of this year, as well as existing pilot programs on the Health Alert Network and the National Electronic Disease Surveillance System. The hearing today will also review best practices for information sharing among federal, state, and local entities to determine our next steps for responding to future bioterrorism crisis. The recent anthrax attack sh shows the need to improve information sharing capabilities of the disparate federal, state, and local health authorities, as well as private hospitals in the event of a public health emergency. Both basic IT infrastructure and communications protocols must be clarified in order to uh, achieve the efficient system necessary to effectively respond to an emergency. This is borne out by CDC's estimate that currently only 68.1 percent of U.S. counties have high-speed Internet access and can receive a broadcast message. Moreover, only 13 states have high-speed Internet connections with all of their counties. Originally, CDC's goal, as stated in their March 2001 report, was to ensure that by 2010 all health departments have continuous high-speed access to the Internet and have established standard protocols for data collection, transport, electronic uh, reporting, and information exchange that protect privacy while seamlessly connecting local, state, and federal data systems. To have immediate online access to current global health recommendations, health and medical data, treatment guidelines, and information on the effectiveness of public health interventions, and to have the capacity to send and receive sensitive health information via secure electronic systems and to broadcast emergency health alerts. In the wake of recent events, the CDC is considering ways to accelerate the timetable for implementation of the recommendations in its March report ahead of the original 2010 target date. In addition, CDC has developed tools for states to perform a self-assessment of information sharing capabilities and has begun to work to develop a grant program to implement these tools, identify gaps, and develop a plan that includes a joint state-local strategy to fill these gaps. Additionally, three ongoing CDC initiatives, the Health Alert Network, EPI-6, and the National Electronic Disease Surveillance System are being used to achieve the recommendations listed above. The Health Alert Network, or the HAN, is a nationwide program to establish the communications, information, distance learning, and organizational infrastructure needed to respond to public health emergencies. It will link local health departments to one another and to other organizations critical for preparedness and response. Its features include providing to state and local health officials high-speed, secure Internet connections, online access to CDC's prevention recommendations, practice guidelines and disease, da and disease data, the capacity to secure, transmit, surveillance, laboratory and other sensitive data, and access to distance learning programs and services and early warning and alert broadcast. Moving forward, 
it's going to be necessary to determine what current federal telecommunications development programs can be used in conjunction with the CDC initiatives to facilitate necessary improvement in the public health IT infrastructure nationwide. Finally, the subcommittee will review the effect media reporting played in the public health community's response to anthrax incidents. As public health professionals attempted to provide warnings and guidance based on traditional epidemiological methods, they often found themselves outpaced by constant media reports. Timely and accurate transmission of information to the general public will be a vital communication objective in future health uh, emergencies. Recent events have shown the slim margin of error in this area before public mistrust begins to take hold. Thus, future communication plans must take into account the role the media will play in shaping public reaction and ensuring the correct message uh, emerges immediately from those responsible for making health policy decisions. The subcommittee today is going to hear testimony from Dr. Edward Baker and Kevin Yakey of the CDC. We'll also hear from Mr. Rock Reagan of the National Association of State Chief Information Officers, Dr. Gianfranco Pizzino of the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists, and Dr. Paul Wiesner of the National Association of County and City Health Officials, Mr. Michael Covert of the American Hospital Association, Dr. Carol Sherritt of the Fairfax County Department of Health, and Dr. Charles Saunders at EDS Healthcare Global Industry Group. I now yield to Congressman Turner for any statement he may wish to make. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for hosting the uh, hearing today on this very critical subject, and I welcome all of our witnesses who have come to share with us the progress that we are making uh, in this area. Uh, there is no question, based on what the Center for Disease Control report uh, told us uh, just a few months ago, that we have serious deficiencies in our public health system and our effort to deal adequately with the threat uh, coming from biological agents. Uh, the recent experience with anthrax, I think, underscores the need to be very aggressive with regard to this particular area. I noted in the CDC report that uh, it concluded that public health agencies lack basic equipment, such as computers and Internet connections, as Chairman Davis mentioned. I had mentioned that many of our public health laboratories are old, outdated, and unsafe. It also acknowledged that uh, many of our physicians and other uh, health professionals across the country are uh, ill-equipped and untrained to deal with the new threats. You know, our nation long ago understood that we had to be ready to respond to nuclear attack, and our early warning systems now that have been in place for a number of years uh, enable us as a nation to respond uh, almost immediately to the threat of a nuclear missile attack. We need to have the same capability with regard to a biological attack. And much less is understood or known about those threats by the American people. And I think our purpose here today is to explore the progress we're making and to determine the direction that we need to go with regard to that very serious threat. So I welcome all of our witnesses today. Thank you for coming, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're also joined today by a Another subcommittee chairman uh, on the government committee, uh, Mr. Horn from California. Any comments to this? I uh, listened to your eloquence and to Mr. Turner's eloquence, and I'm ready to listen to the witnesses. So thanks for putting the hearing together. Thank you very much. Um, I'll call our first panel of witnesses to testify. As you know, it's the policy of this committee that all witnesses be sworn uh, when you testify. Would you please uh, rise with me and raise your right hand? You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. To afford sufficient time for questions, the witnesses, uh, I'd like you to try to stay at five minutes. We have a, each of you ha has a green light there. When it turns yellow, you have a minute to sum up. We have your complete statement, and that is included in the record. Um, so we will start uh, with Dr. Baker. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm Dr. Edward Baker. I serve as director of CDC's Public Health Practice Program Office, and with me today is Dr. Kevin Yeski, who currently serves as director of our Bioterrorism Preparedness and Response Program. Thank you for this invitation, and as you know, increased vigilance and preparedness for unexplained illnesses and injuries are an essential part of the public health effort to protect our citizens against terrorism and other public health threats. 
The terrorist events on and since September the 11th have been defining moments for all of us, and they've greatly sharpened our nation's focus on public health. Even before the September 11th attack, CDC was making substantial progress to define, develop, and implement nationwide a set of strategies and capacities required at the local, state, and federal level to prepare for and to respond to deliberate attacks on the health of our citizens. Since September 11th, we've worked very closely with our public health partners to accelerate these efforts, to share critical lessons learned, and to identify seven specific high-priority areas for immediate strengthening. We're committed to working with you and others to increase our efforts even further in the months ahead. As you know, CDC serves as a trusted source of scientific information on emerging infectious diseases and many other public health threats. Since September the 11th, CDC has issued uh, 175 updates on the response to the terrorist attacks and anthrax investigations through a variety of communications channels reaching an estimated 7 million health professionals in the public. These have included our rapid communication systems, the bioterrorism website, which is www.bt.cdc.gov, nationwide satellite broadcasts through our public health training network, and special telephone hotlines. This level of communication and collaboration with our partners has been crucial to the investigation and response to these events but improvements can be made, as called for in CDC's report, which you, Mr. Chairman, referred to a moment ago, the report entitled Public Health's Infrastructure, a Status Report. The specific recommendations regarding information systems are being achieved through three major initiatives that you referred to a moment ago, the Health Alert Network, the National Electronic Disease Surveillance System, and Epidemiologic in Information Exchange, or as we call it, EPI-X. I'd like to describe each of these briefly. The Health Alert Network, as you mentioned earlier, is designed to be the nation's rapid online system for health communications information and training. When fully deployed, the Health Alert Network will link all local, state, and federal public health agencies to each other and to their community partners, private health care providers, and will serve as an electronic platform for the applications that I've mentioned. On the morning of September the 11th, the Health Alert Network was fully activated within four hours of the attack on the World Trade Center. We issued an alert to top public health officials across the country, and in the ensuing 12 weeks, some 60 alerts, advisories, and updates have been distributed through the network. To date, as you mentioned a moment ago, 13 states have directly connected all of their counties electronically to the Health Alert Network via high-speed continuous internet connections, and 68% of all U.S. counties are now connected. The Epidemiologic Information Exchange, or EPI-X, is CDC's secure web-based communication system, which serves as a portal for private electronic exchange of epidemiologic information. In response to the attacks of September the 11th and subsequent events, the EPI-X system has immediately provided secure communications among state and large city epidemiologists and CDC programs, including our Epidemiologic in Intelligence Service. The National Electronic Disease Surveillance System is a visionary system which will be built on the platform of the Health Alert Network. It is targeted toward electronic, real-time reporting of information for public health action. It is designed to provide an integrated, coherent national system for public health surveillance that will have the flexibility and capacity to support a wide range of public health efforts, including our emergency response. So what have we learned from these recent events? We have learned many lessons. First of all, that these unprecedented events have given us a chance to work and prepare for the next challenge with a deeper understanding of bioterrorism and how we share information. We've learned that linkages that we have forged between clinical and public health communities are strong and that these linkages have saved lives by detecting disease early. We have learned how to shorten the time lag between acquiring new knowledge, communication, and action, and we have confirmed that close collaboration between local, state, and federal officials builds confidence in our local response. And finally, we have learned more about what information is valuable to the public and to our partners and that will help us craft messages and materials in the future. In conclusion, 
we have made substantial progress to date in enhancing the nation's capability to prepare for and to respond to a bioterrorist event, but there is much more to be done. The best public health strategy to protect citizens against terrorism is the development, organization, and enhancement of public health prevention systems and tools, including enhanced communication systems and messages. Not only will this approach ensure that we are better prepared for a bioterrorism event, but it will also enable us to do our jobs better every day. A strong and flexible public health infrastructure is the, the best defense against any disease threat. Thank you very much for your attention and for your leadership in bringing this issue to national attention. Dr. Yeski and I are happy to address any of your questions. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Yeski, you're just here to help answer questions, is that right? That's correct. Um, and then before, uh, before I go to Mr. Horn, I, Steve, I'll start with you, but I want to ask one question. A specific concern raised by local health departments was that it was unclear exactly who was in charge at the federal level. Uh, before we embark on an in-depth examination of information sharing capability, has CDC moved to address this fundamental point, who's in charge? Uh, this is a challenging issue, as you know, and what we do at CDC is to work with our local and state partners in any investigation of a disease outbreak. And so we work to defer to the local authorities as they relate to the media and relate to their communities to provide information. As far as within the federal system, CDC is designated as the lead public health agency in events of this type. Getting the word out is very, very important. We'll hear some of the later testimony in terms of some of the confusion. Um, I can recognize the gentleman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've got one interest, and that's the laboratory interest. Uh, are they spread accurately across the counties that you mentioned that uh, had this network in computing? Uh, one of our problems in the last 30 years has been where doctors had their own laboratory. It was separated because it was felt they would to get just their labs and they were told to go get separate labs. And hospitals have certain labs. So if you have some of this type of uh, uh, either flu that uh, some biological or chemical uh, how do we deal with that and uh, get that done in a very rapidly time so people aren't panicking? What's your feeling on that, and what should we do to link all those labs up? Uh, two thoughts, uh, Congressman. One is that there is an activity underway called the Laboratory Response Network. This was created under the bioterrorism program, and this network has been used extensively uh, throughout the anthrax situation to handle samples. It was used extensively in Florida uh, to process materials there. And expansion and strengthening of that network is one specific way to address part of what you're asking about. A second major initiative is one that we refer to as the National Laboratory System. You mentioned private hospitals. We believe there needs to be a concerted national effort to link the public health laboratories that are typically run by governmental agencies and private hospital laboratories in a much more seamless way to move information back and forth between them, to share information, to have standard protocols, standard ways of transmitting samples back and forth so we can track them more efficiently. So those are the two initiatives that are underway to address the, the laboratory issue. What about the uh, smallest towns, uh, do we separate them at certain things and get a different chain or what? Within the laboratory response network, there are levels of activity and the, the smallest level, the lowest level has the least complexity. A small local hospital laboratory, for example, would have that capacity in most situations. And then as you move up the level of complexity, there are more centralized laboratories. Uh, that address this. Uh, our commitment is that every community, regardless of how remote or how rural, have access to those laboratory services. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Ms. Turner? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With regard to increased coordination, uh, tell us a little bit about the degree of coordination uh, between our federal agencies. In particular, uh, I have on my mind, as many of us do, the recent reports about the Department of the Army's research in, on anthrax and the fact that apparently that may not have been known by other agencies of government. 
Uh, is that a problem, and should there be greater coordination and knowledge exchange there? Uh, I'm going to defer to Dr. Yeski a bit on the specifics, and that he's more directly involved with the anthrax activities than I am, but just a general a thought on that. There have been very close collaborations with various parts of the uh, uh, Army USAMRID, the, the laboratory that does the work, as you know, on infectious disease research, has worked very closely with CDC throughout the course of, of the anthrax uh, situation. Again, it's always good to have more collaboration and more communication. We never can do that uh, too much. But I'd like Dr. Yeski to elaborate a bit on, on your question. I would agree with Dr. Baker that in increased and improved coordination and integration is a uh, desired goal. Uh, CDC worked hard to and continues to work hard to integrate our activities with other federal agencies, both within DHHS, such as the FDA or the Office of Emergency Preparedness, as well as outside uh, the department with Department of Justice, with Environmental Protection Agency, and others. We, we try and coordinate. We, during the anthrax incident, had close collaborations with all those organizations, had a full-time liaison established at the FBI headquarters, uh, had a full-time liaison at the U.S. Postal Service office to <coughs> help coordinate our activities with theirs. So we uh, attempted to uh, make our best efforts at coordinating our activities both within DHHS as well as uh, outside the, the department. Are there, is there full disclosure between those agencies and those laboratories or do each of them just sort of go their own way? With share what they want to, when they want to. I, I can speak for CDC's laboratories. We tried to coordinate and had daily telephone conferences with both the FBI laboratory personnel as well as Department of Defense personnel to help coordinate lab result reporting uh, during the anthrax incident. What kind of tracking is there of, <coughs> of um, dangerous uh, biological agents when they're transferred from one lab to the other? And are those protocols common throughout government agencies or do they vary from one to the other? The, the transport of, of the hazardous agents falls under the select agent rule where organizations or institutions that manage or er, that are involved in the interstate transport of hazardous biological agents must register and then coordinate those transfers uh, with, the, with the CDC and the, and the federal government. And by what method are, are those agents transmitted? Is it by ordinary private carrier? U.S. mail, or how do those things travel when they? There's established protocols for the for the uh, transport of those materials to ensure that uh, the integrity of the packages remains during the transfer of those, and CDC has written protocols that govern that. And what what method of transport is used for those kind of materials? Depending on distance, it can be air courier, it can be uh, ground transportation, but it's usually uh, it's usually regular courier, uh, private service. So the private service uh, transmitting the package would know it's dangerous, but may not know exactly what they're transmitting That's from correct. one locale to the other. That's correct. Is that a, an appropriate way to handle this type of material, or should it be handled by the agency uh, and its employees by personal delivery rather than by using private carriers? I will uh, have to provide that information uh, for the record at a later time. Does that answer mean you, you don't have an opinion or you are not familiar enough with the process to have an opinion? My opinion is that it's appropriate. Uh, um, it's an appropriate mechanism for the transport of, of the materials. We've if we were going to suggest improvement in the handling of that material, what kind of things would you suggest that we, we look at? I think we need to examine to see if there's me methodologies to improve the packaging integrity, uh, the notification of how the material is uh, sent from one organization to the other, receipt times, anticipated delivery times, things like that, ensuring the security of that package as it, tr it goes through the transport system. Should we be reevaluating re uh, who we share this material with? In other words, I understand that some private labs can have access to some materials. Uh, I believe that's correct, isn't it, Dr. Baker? What we might want to do just on this line of questioning, if this would be responsive, Congressman, is as I understand your, your request here, you're asking us about the transport of hazardous materials for which CDC does have responsibility under the uh, select agent rule, as Dr. Yeski mentioned. 
Uh, we do not, each of us do not deal directly with that particular area of activity. Uh, inevitably, in light of recent events, we're rethinking a lot of things that we're doing, and this may be one of them. I can't tell you that today. And we'd be happy to provide to you and work with you on specific areas that may need improvement, uh, including how these get transported and, and, and some of the issues that, that, uh, that you're uh, raising for us today. Uh, if that would be helpful to you in response. It would be helpful. And I, as I understood your answer there, you, you are already beginning to look at those protocols. My, what, I'm, what I said was that in light of recent events, we in public health are rethinking a lot of things. This has been an extraordinary experience for all of us. And uh, CDC has been having a number of expert meetings over the last several weeks, bringing in experts from around the country to reflect on what has been happening and to then learn from each of these uh, uh, groups of people that come in. A and we can share with you both that sort of thing and, and on the specific issue that you raised in terms of the transport of hazardous materials. We're uh, undoubtedly rethinking that, but neither of us are directly involved in those, uh, in those discussions. So we'd be happy to share that with you if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I have a few questions. Um, t today on the second panel, Dr. Sherritt, who is from my home county of Fairfax, is going to testify that the lack of CDC guidelines on anthrax uh, initially created both anxiety and inconsistency in patient care. We also know the example of the post office reacting differently to this, looking at we, what we I think might have been best available information differently than Congress did as the information became available. I guess my question is, how would you characterize CDC's uh, actions in this? And uh, what are we doing to ensure that we get a better response in the future? Uh, I recognize we're on new ground, and this right. came out of nowhere. And so, it's right. Right. so we're just looking back here, not looking for people to, to jump on. But we want to understand what happened and how we can uh, uh, better it the next time. Exactly. The first thing I was going to say, uh, Congressman Davis, was exactly what you just said. This is clearly an unprecedented event, and we all recognize that. Uh, and the response, both at CDC and at the state and local level, has been unprecedented. We've had folks flying in to various parts of the country. We have been issuing alert notices over the Internet. We've been doing nationwide satellite broadcasts. All of these are unprecedented responses, and we've learned from each of those uh, particular activities. And again, it's, it's important, we think, to go back and look at what did happen, as you're doing here today, and learn from those lessons and therefore do better uh, next time. Uh, this was a bit of a shakedown cruise for all of us in terms of the whole public health system and our information systems in particular. Uh, we're very proud of the way in which CDC and our partners were able to get information out through these mechanisms that we've talked with you about today. As I mentioned, we issued an alert four hours after the, the World Trade Center uh, event, around 1.30 on, on that afternoon, and issued alerts that went out now to as many as a million people uh, on various aspects of the anthrax investigation. We've done a series of nationwide teleconferences. We did one just yesterday on smallpox. That whole series has reached over a million people. Uh, this is a distance learning network that we utilize to educate our, our uh, public health workforce around the country. Uh, it, unquestionably, we will be better off next time. Why will we be better off? First of all, the networks are in place and they're working and they're being expanded. And so through all of this, through that experience, we've improved our relationships. We know better how to work this system. Secondly, we have developed a very large amount of question and answer, very specific information on, on a lot of aspects here that come up in the course of this investigation. Let me ask you this. Does, does, your, does your distance learning, like uh, yesterday, does that reach the private health providers as yes, well? Yes, sir. We have done programs in cooperation with the American Medical Association, American Hospital Association, National Medical Association, a range of partners, public health, private. Uh, and again, as I said, these broadcasts, the, the first one we did on anthrax, I think, reached about 500,000 people. And it's on the Internet. You can go there and, and pick it up later on. It's actually being picked up overseas as well, we're told. Okay. Um, another panelist in the next panel notes in his prepared statement that the NEDSS, Han, and the Epi-6 projects are not always as uh, well-coordinated 
and sometimes appear to have a little competition uh, between them. Do um, you think that's accurate? And uh, competition is not always bad, but it's just in terms of when you want to disseminate information, you just have to take a team approach to get it out there and not try to play territorial. I mean, do, do you feel there is some of that? Or are we still trying to get bugs out of that system? These are three new systems. <clears throat> Several thoughts. These are three new systems. That's the first and most important point. Um, this is an ambitious enterprise overall to create an integrated public health information and communication system. And it's best to think of these three elements as three initiatives that ultimately flow together into an integrated approach to improving the way in which we share information. The EpiX program is a confidential private way in which epidemiologists are sharing information back and forth. So the members of this network, there are over 700 participants now, can log on to a secure website and can talk back and forth about epidemiologic issues. The NEDS program, or the National Electronic Disease Surveillance System, is quite complex and quite challenging. Ultimately, when it is in place, it will be a marvelous tool for public health, but it's the one that's really the, the, the least far along in, in terms of its actual implementation, and the reason for that has to do with the complexity. The basic answer to your question is that these are three complementary approaches. The Health Alert Network provides the platform. It connects everyone to the Internet. The EPIX program and the National Electronic Disease Surveillance Systems are supported by that platform. Okay. <clears throat> to what steps are you taking to help ensure u uniformity and control system architecture once systems like the NEDSS are implemented by individual states? Is there or will there be uh, an oversight or central control board to regulate how the systems are used or modified? Uh, first of all, for the Health Alert Network system, we have technological standards that were put in place a couple of years ago, and we're just in the process of updating them. So there will be then, from CDC, a set of technology standards that grantees under that grant program are provided with, so that therefore they can buy the right kind of computers, they'll have the right way to connect to the Internet and those kinds of things. As far as the National Electronic Disease Surveillance System, they're a very extensive and complex set of standards that NEDS participants will be asked to adhere to. So it's a standard-based approach. Again, ultimately, you won't be able to participate in these systems if you do not adhere to the standards. Okay. Can, the, can Han be expanded to include uh, private health care providers? We are expanding it now to include, include private health care providers. Uh, since September 11th, we've increased the distribution. Uh, we worked, as I mentioned earlier, with American Medical Association, American Hospital Association. The way this works is that we send a health alert network notice to professional organizations like the ones I mentioned, and they send it out to their members. You know, one of the problems with anthrax, and we, you, you can take a look at whether it's smallpox or plague or whatever, is insufficient vaccines on hand, available, ready to go. Uh, obviously, uh, we, we were caught off guard this is the first time we faced this. How are we preparing in the future uh, on this? Do you have guidelines? We're looking ahead now to possibly expanded uh, germ warfare, biological warfare. Um, I'd like to begin the answer, but ask Dr. Yeski to elaborate. Uh, on the smallpox issue, Congressman, we did a nationwide satellite teleconference just yesterday to inform the public and private health care communities about smallpox. It included experts from around the country. Secretary Thompson uh, kicked that program off. Dr. Copeland, who's our director at CDC, participated. Uh, Dr. Henderson, who's now working in the department, also was part of that program. It was designed to educate people about smallpox and familiarize them with a major new plan that's just been sent out to our partners to look at as far as smallpox is concerned. And as you know, the department and CDC are committed to getting increased amounts of smallpox vaccines so that those will be available to people if the, if the need should arise. Yeah, I, I would agree. Our, our contingency plannings and our preparations for additional agents that might uh, be used as a biological weapon continue. Uh, we recently uh, released a smallpox emergency response plan to state and, uh, health officers. We continue to look at other agents and preparing response plans for those particular agents and ways of enhancing the public health infrastructure so we can respond more appropriately for uh, an, another event with a different agent. Let me ask another question. This really goes throughout information expanding to all of us, uh, whether it's congressional briefings on what's happening in Afghanistan or whatever. I learned more from television. 
that I get from all the darn briefings. I don't know how my colleagues feel about it, but I sometimes get more of that. Same here in, in your case. It seems that CDC might be able to communicate to the general public, not talking about other health officials and providers, but directly to the public using the news media. Are there any plans to aggressively make use of the media in future events so that the CDC message, not the message of endless consultants hired by the media, uh, can get out to the public? Because at the end of the day, you are the umpire calling the balls and strikes on some of this and are closest to the problem and have, I think, for the most part, the most up-to-date uh, research and information. I, I think that's fair. A uh, couple of thoughts on that. First of all, um, I, I personally, I think many of us at CDC were very proud of the role that our director, Dr. Copeland, played in communicating through the media directly to the public and did exactly what you're talking about, Congressman, of trying to work with the media to get the message uh, out. And other experts at CDC were involved in doing this as well. There was a daily briefing of our public affairs office with the media folks to give them the information that they need to do their job. And so working closely uh, in partnership with the media is a very important part of this. Also, some of the things that we do directly, like the teleconference series that I'm by the media uh, and are utilized in various ways. And, and again, we uh, have learned a lot. I think one of the areas that we will now do better on is this whole area of working with the media in a, in a complementary, coordinated way uh, and do a better job next time. Uh, again, we, we're proud of what we've done, but we've always, uh, we always have opportunities to, to learn from this experience. Okay. Finally, in uh, the testimony in the next panel, <clears throat> we're going to hear a statement that there are, that we're going to hear concerns that certain aspects of the privacy provisions in HIPAA uh, will hinder efforts to improve surveillance. Have you considered these concerns and it, do you think it might be necessary to revise the privacy regulations and are you, you comfortable? It's always a tough balance over what should be private and what should be public right. in these issues. But. Uh, this is an area which I believe we would best be advised to give you a, an answer back. Uh, HIPAA is a very complex uh, area. Others at CDC work on that, and uh, perhaps we'd be best advised just to answer that one uh, for the record. Um, I would like, if I could, to just to mention one final point, since I, I believe we're drawing to a close here. We particularly appreciate the, the uh, support of the Congress in passing legislation uh, the Public Health Threats and Emergencies Act last year. The uh, act was, as you know, initiated uh, in the Senate and the House activities are very important. And this provides us with an unprecedented opportunity to strengthen the public health infrastructure through a new grant program that we'll be developing with our partners. So again, we appreciate uh, the leadership here in, in the House and the Senate on that legislation. Uh, and we're committed to working as quickly as we can to, to get those resources out and to implement that piece of legislation. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to recognize Mr. Turner. Uh, Dr. Baker, is there a national registry of all dangerous biological agents identifying their location and who is responsible for those agents? Um, I understand your question. Um, I'll begin an answer, and I think probably best to elaborate for the record. Uh, Dr. Yeski mentioned earlier, and Kevin, you may want to say more about this, the select agent rule is part of what we're talking about. There are a list of specific agents that are listed there. These are biological agents. There's, there are also chemical agents where inventories are done. I'm not sure if your question really related specifically to biological or more broadly than that. And there are also ways in which those are inventoried and then people understand, for example, where a particular chemical is located in terms of the plant and, and, and how it's handled and that sort of thing. Is that well, with regard, let's say, with regard to biological agents, uh, is there a master list kept somewhere that would tell us where all of the dangerous biological agents would be in this country and who is responsible for them at those lo locations? We're not aware of that. I understand the nature of your question, and what we'll do is to uh, come up with uh, our best answer to that um, in terms of what actually is done in tracking these hazardous agents. I think that's what you're asking about. Is, is there even a, a list of what we uh, would call dangerous biological agents? Is there an agreed list as to what There is an are? agreed list of what we consider the important agents as far as terrorism is concerned. Those, are, those have been identified. And then there are the, the select agents which are comparable to those, and we can provide that list to the committee. W would it not be appropriate 
if we have not already, already done so, to have a law that requires a national registry so that we would know where all of those dangerous biological agents are at any given moment in this country, who has possession of them, and who is responsible for them at those locations? Um, I understand your question. I understand the logic of, of your uh, suggestion. I'm not in a position to say yes or no to, to your question today, but we will be happy to do so for the record. I understand your question. Dr. Yeski, do you have an opinion on that? Uh, again, I agree with Dr. Baker. We'll be happy to provide a list of that, of the agents, and uh, how they're managed. It seems to me in this age of biological terrorist threat that it would be wise if we at least had some requirement that those dangerous agents and their locations be known, uh, perhaps even to go so far as to have some notification system in place for the transfer mm -hmm. of those agents. I, I assume by your answers to the previous questions there must be no control whatsoever on the import or export of dangerous biological agents into this country? I would go so far as to say I don't believe that that's true. And again, I'm sorry that we don't have the, the information at our fingertips to answer your question um, as far as the importation piece is concerned. And, well, and we'll, I would appreciate if you will. could give us some response to that, because I'd like to know if there is a uh, a list somewhere of all of those agents, where they are, who's responsible for them, and if there's any control whatsoever on the transport of those, any notification requirements when they are transported within our country or when they're imported or exported. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to work with you on that. Any other questions? Mr. Horn, any, any other questions for this panel? All right. Well, I thank you very much. Uh, and what I think we will do, um, you'll have 10 days to supplement any, any, any remarks that you'd like to make. We'll take a three-minute break as we change panels and allow the next panel to come forward. We appreciate very much your being here today.
is the um, policy of the committee to swear in witnesses. If you'd rise with me and raise your right hand. You all solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Please be seated. See, we have our indicator box in the front. It'll turn green. What we'd like you to try to do is stay within five minutes because your total testimony is part of the official record. We're going to start with Rock Regan over here. Rock, we're going to start with you. And it's Gregory. Is that your, your actual name? Uh, Greg. Greg, I remember that. Uh, but uh, listen, we appreciate all of you being here. And uh, we'll start uh, with, uh, with the Rock over here and move straight down. Uh, try to keep it within five minutes, and then we'll go to questions. Going to appreciate everyone being here. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Rock Regan. I'm the uh, Chief Information Officer with the State of Connecticut and the uh, President of the National Association of State Chief Inf Information Officers. And again, it's a uh, pleasure to be here to talk about this, uh, such an important issue. The events of the last three months have galvanized government at all levels uh, to increase our emergency preparedness capabilities for a range of threats. The threat of bioterrorism is among the, one of the most challenging and terrifying among them. The current anthrax crisis, which has hit so close to home uh, in Connecticut, the U.S. Capitol, um, as well as recent outbreaks of Ebola virus in Africa, illustrate so clearly how important uh, our bioemergency response preparedness is. As has been observed by many, uh, uh, our first line of defense in preparing for bioterror is our ability to communicate and coordinate. Our information and communication systems lie at the very heart of our response. The State Chief Information Officers sit at the nexus of these communication and coordination systems, and we appreciate, again, you calling this hearing on these important issues of today. I think, uh, as mentioned earlier, the uh, March 2000 report by the CDC outlined a, a couple of specific goals. Um, skilled workforce, robust information and in, uh, data systems, effective health departments and laboratories. Uh, certainly our focus is on the second one, robust information and data systems. NASIO uh, agrees with the uh, CDC's uh, March assessment uh, in terms of uh, the HAN initiative as, as well as the uh, National Electronic Disease Surveillance System. Uh, HAN and uh, uh, any um, D, uh, any DSS is a uh, is a great uh, first start. Uh, in Connecticut, uh, I can personalize this. The uh, any uh, National Electronic Disease Surveillance System will replace 18 uh, stovepipe systems with an integrated uh, data repository for the sharing of, of this information. So I think, as Dr. Baker said, it's a very complex process to put that together. But I think the benefit will be uh, will be great. <coughs> These goals, again, are, uh, which are, again, are critically important uh, um, for all health departments in the nation to have continuous high-speed uh, access to the Internet, uh, is going to require substantial investment uh, for states and local, uh, local governments, which, again, they cannot bear alone. I think, um, um, you know, as we, as we go forward and look at the, the deployment of these systems, the, the one fact that has to be considered is the, uh, the current networks that are available in the uh, state and local governments. Beyond Han, really, uh, the way to do that is a uh, coordinated, uh, integrated state information architecture. And if I could um, talk specifically about a couple of issues that NASIO is involved with, uh, there's currently one with the criminal justice community, a global justice initiative to create uh, a national integrated architecture for justice systems. Um, it doesn't appear, uh, by my knowledge, those are the CIOs that I've talked to, that this effort is, uh, is underway for uh, the public health uh, infrastructure. While the, uh, the initiatives going forward, uh, again, are very uh, critical, it's unclear, I think, uh, from many of our perspectives of how they plug into the overall architecture. Standards are great, but uh, certainly local, uh, local governments and state governments would like to have a say, again, in how those standards are put together and how they fit into the overall uh, overriding architecture. The uh, justice uh, integration architecture, uh, to me, would be a, a blueprint to follow for the public health systems. Again, as we look at these initiatives, such as anthrax, the ability to cross-communicate uh, uh, information on a very timely basis crosses multi-jurisdictions, not just health agencies, it's public safety, uh, governors, um, other uh, departmental agencies within, uh, within states and uh, local governments, particularly first responders. The state, and, uh, state CIOs and federal home, uh, home, homeland defense officials, in conjunction with uh, Justice and CDC, again, may do well in considering using the Justice uh, in Integrated Architectural Process uh, here for uh, creating a public health information architecture 
It again fits in with an overall state architecture and a homeland defense scenario. Uh, this integration will allow for access as appropriate to vital alert and response information by all affected state agencies. Again, getting back to Connecticut, Connecticut, we had an anthrax issue, uh, a 94-year-old woman who um, um, passed away as a result of the anthrax. We had a very uh, excellent response by CDC. Uh, over 20 uh, people responded, FBI, over 20 people responded. But think in context of what it had been instead of one event, 10 events, 100 events, 1,000 events across the country, our ability to communicate uh, was not in place. And I think that the uh, infrastructure and architecture that we're talking about in these networks will be the vehicle to do it. We're just not going to have enough trained people uh, to respond uh, to these situations. So the communication infrastructures will be vital in any response, uh, particularly if it is a uh, national response. State CIOs, uh, again, want to be involved in the planning process. And to, uh, to sum up, I think um, as we talk about communicating, it's not just one way from the federal government down to the state and local uh, jurisdictions. It's, uh, it's multi-way uh, processing, down from the feds, up from the local state uh, to the feds, again, the sharing of information. And uh, summarizing, um, I've been asked by my governor to ensure effective information communications infrastructure for responding to the uh, bioterror threats. Um, as the nation's governments gear up to prepare for these bioterrorism threats, NASIO believes the path to efficient implementation of, of preparedness initiatives lies within open coordination between all levels of government and views toward information systems that emphasize open architectures rather than closed stovepipe systems. To this end, NASIO has opened up communications with Director Ridge's Office of Homeland Security and would, would be pleased to coordinate and initiate coordinating relationships with CDC um, and others to more effectively implement our public health infrastructure improvements effort. These efforts, we believe, are necessary to safeguard the American public in, in every part of the nation, in every state, in every county, and in every city. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to speak before you today. Thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. Regan. Dr. Pizzino. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I'm Dr. Gianfranco Pizzino, state epidemiologist with the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. I'm very pleased to be here today in my capacity as president-elect of the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists, CSTE. I was asked to address questions today revolving around how the use of appropriate information technologies has helped public health officials in the management of the anthrax crisis of the past months. For more than a decade, CST has urged CDC to move away from a model of separated, self-contained surveillance systems and to work toward a flexible integrated solution. Three initiatives have been developed in the past few years by the CDC with substantial input from local and state public health partners. These initiatives are NEDS, the Health Alert Network, and APX. NEDS is an important effort. One important function of NEDS is the establishment of standard architecture based on current industry standards for public health electronic information systems. The use of these standards will allow agencies to achieve a more effective use of information technology and to share data. The second initiative is the Health Alert Network. This is primarily an infrastructure project to improve the information technology infrastructure in local and state health departments by helping public health agencies to obtain internet and email access. And the third project, APX, is an internet application developed by the CDC. Through its secure website, APX allows public health officials to exchange communication about outbreaks and other emergency health events. This electronic forum has been extensively used during the anthrax-related emergency to share information, experience, and intervention protocols. Another unique feature of APX is emergency notification by telephone or pager to the fine groups of public health officials. So how do these projects interact with each other? APX uses the standards defined by NEDS and exploits the network built through the Health Talent Network. All these three projects provided some essential functions during the response to the anthrax threat of the past months. The pager that I'm carrying here today is a Health Alert Network pager. This pager received multiple messages from the APX project in the past few months, and many of these messages directed me to go to the APX secure website that was set up using NED standards. So in summary, each project gains strength from the presence of the others, and none of them can be successful alone. 
While these are positive developments, much work remains to be done. We have identified three priority areas that need immediate attention. First, the process of integration envisioned by NEDS is far from being completed. Even the three projects that I've mentioned, NEDS, Health Alert, and APX, have not always built on each other's strengths. And at times, they have appeared to compete for the same scarce resources or to attempt to establish one project as the only one worth expansion. Adequate funding for all these three projects must be assured, and the three projects must work together to achieve their common goals. The second area of priority is the link between public health departments and private health care providers. Virtually all public health emergency will be detected through information available from some private providers. Currently, the most common communication methods between private providers and public health departments remain mail, fax, or telephone. It takes about three days for my office to prepare mailing labels, duplicate a letter, and put it in, in the mail so that we can reach our thousands of providers throughout the state with some public health notification. Private health care providers also play a key role in the response to public health emergencies, and the health alert network needs to be expanded to include private providers so that they can be quickly notified of the existence of public health threats and how to contain them. And finally, it should never be forgotten that the functioning of even the best computer network remains based on the presence of trained, skilled, qualified public health workers. The most timely alert will be of little use when it reaches a health department running three half days a week and staffed with one part-time nurse, as it happens in some rural areas of my state and other parts of the country. Funding for the support of a basic public health infrastructure must increase dramatically, and it must represent a sustained effort over time. In conclusion, CSD supports and appreciates the efforts made by the CDC in the past few years to improve and integrate public health information systems, but many barriers remain. Nevertheless, projects such as NEDS, Health Alert, and APX have contributed enormously toward achieving better integration of information more timely detection of public health emergencies, and more prompt and effective dissemination of health alert messages. These initiatives are all complementary to each other, and funding and support for all of them must grow considerably so that the expected results can be achieved in as short time as possible. We cannot afford to wait. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify here this morning on this important topic. Thank you very much, <coughs> Dr. Weiser. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm Dr. Paul Wiesner. I'm the director of the Board of Health in DeKalb County, Georgia. I'm pleased to uh, present testimony here today on behalf of the National Association of County and City Health Officials. That's the organization that represents the nearly 3,000 local health departments in the United States. CDC had the foresight to establish three local centers for public health preparedness in late 1999. And uh, we are, we're fortunate enough to direct one of those centers. This morning, I'm going to focus only on two of the lessons that NACHO has learned about dissemination of information and building public health infrastructure through, health, through the Health Alert Network. The timetable for, uh, for achieving the goals uh, stated in CDC's report that the chairman mentioned earlier must be rapidly accelerated. Early detection and a timely response to a bioterrorist attack depends upon a solid local and state public health infrastructure. This infrastructure requires a crucial array of capacities, a trained workforce under top-notch organizational management, partnerships uh, building, systems readiness, epidemiological laboratory and surveillance expertise, information and communication systems, and the ability to develop local programs and local policies. Without the fundamental capacity, which we, which, which we call infrastructure, the local health department is unable to address the regular community health problems that exist in the community, the threats that come from either infectious disease or environmental hazards, and certainly counter the threats from uh, potential bioterrorism. That same in infrastructure that's used for all of the other uh, practices of public health in a local community are the, are the framework and foundation for preparation for bioterrorism. 
The local public health department, in many ways, is the linchpin of bioterrorism preparedness. Now, today, the general population has an unprecedented understanding of the importance of public health. But they have little grasp of the magnitude of transformation that is needed in public health practice nationwide. For all health departments in the country, capacities have not kept pace with the challenges. We must have a long-term initiative to restructure and rebuild the nation's public health infrastructure at the state and local level, as well as the federal level. Because only in that case will we have our, everyone in our communities uh, protected. Now I'm going to talk about a second point that is a little bit more subtle and less direct than the infrastructure question, but it's no less critical. No one doubts the need for a rapidly uh, rapidly and accurately transmitting information vertically in the public health system, up and down between the uh, federal, state, and local uh, in, uh, public health agencies. That's absolutely vital. But what is just as important is what is, might be called the horizontal communication and transmission of information in all levels of government, and building those systems that communicate horizontally within our communities. Substantial investments in technology and systems building are needed. The needs at this local level, where, where I work, uh, what I might call the retail level of public health, uh, are substantial. We need real-time surveillance systems on the ground, rapid, secure, and redundant communication at this level throughout the country, educational and training resources for us and our partners, and there are many within a local community beyond the, simply the hospital and the, uh, the, the medical practitioner, well-trained uh, public health investigative teams, local plans for pharmaceutical uh, assessment and acquisition and distribution, and periodic testing of communication uh, protocols, technology, and our overall local plan for bioterrorism response. NATO's experience with the CDC-supported centers has, has, has demonstrated that there's one core element as far as that horizontal development, and that is partnership development. Improvements in technology must be linked to a horizontal system of solid local relationships between public and private agencies. Now, in conclusion, uh, significant investments of people and money will achieve this new level of public health preparedness. Restoring the local public health infrastructure creates the sustaining foundation for preparedness. Threats to the public health do not respect jurisdictional boundaries, so if, if we're all going to be protected, every health department must be able to contribute to this. Sustaining this effort requires a commitment from all levels of government. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Covert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the uh, committee, staff members. Uh, I'm pleased to have an opportunity to uh, present before you today. I'm Michael H. Covert, president of the Washington Hospital Center here in Washington, D.C. And I'm here today representing the American Hospital Association and its nearly 5,000 hospitals, health systems, networks, and other providers of care. One of our key readiness challenges is to foster stronger ties between the public health system and hospitals. Hospitals are a public safety asset. We need to better integrate hospitals into the public health and safety infrastructure to enhance our community's ability to respond to disaster. This will require a federal recognition of the important role that hospitals and health systems need to play in coordinating community-wide efforts to deal with disasters, including potential acts of bioterrorism. And it will take a commitment of federal resources to support efforts by hospitals and public health departments to access and distribute information and emergency alerts, monitor the health of communities, and help detect emerging health problems. Let me share with you some of the lessons that we've learned from our experience in dealing with the recent outbreaks of anthrax in the nation's capital area. We learned that a lack of effective integration and communication between the federal government and our local health department early on stymied our ability to effectively plan for the screening and monitoring of a large number of anthrax patients. By the way, we saw over 500. 
There was no regional tracking mechanism to capture information that could have been used for monitoring epidemiological trends. Each institution in the first days was left to its own devices to gather information on how best to treat patients and then in turn share it with the health department. Many questions arose as to how to maintain the privacy and confidentiality of this data. These concerns will only be exacerbated by the new Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act's medical privacy regulations. Our experience in responding to anthrax cases also underscores the need for public health departments to be able to update hospitals continually on key developments. But the health department was often unable to do so, which affected our ability to plan for care and staffing. Another potential problem is the jurisdictional issue. Who coordinates surveillance efforts to avoid duplication? In rural areas of the country, hospitals will need to play a larger role in performing many of the duties that a health department would normally perform. As a former health director, I know there were many communities that lacked the resources and personnel to track and manage a mass casualty incident. There also needs to be better and more sophisticated gathering of data and operations of artificial intelligence capabilities to help evaluate patients who may be victims of a terrorist attack. Ideally, these systems should also tie into hospitals' electronic medical records. Over and over again, the points of failure in a disaster response are the information and communications systems. Cell phones don't work. Landline telephone systems are overloaded. There are no systems for tracking patient data on a regional basis. We need to invest a large amount of money to build an information and communications infrastructure that has capacity, redundancy, and robustness, and includes all public safety agencies, police, fire, EMS, and hospitals. Mr. Chairman, September 11th and the aftermath changed the way hospitals must think of disaster readiness. Hospitals must now prepare for what once was unimaginable. For example, the Washington Hospital Center will need to invest in more than over $40 million to deal with current readiness needs today. One fourth of those dollars, between eight and 10 million, are needed to be spent on information systems, communications, and technology. When you hear the request for significant funding by the AHA, they are very much on track, at least with what I believe, with what we are finding at the individual hospital level. To strengthen community readiness, the AHA is pleased to be a part of a new coalition, the Partnership for Community Safety. The partnership includes public health officials, hospitals, fire chiefs, emergency physicians, emergency medical personnel, and nurse leaders, the heart of any community's frontline emergency response efforts. And I know that you recognize that. In conclusion, hospitals are upgrading existing disaster plans and continue to tailor their disaster plans to suit individual needs of the community in the face of new threats. America's caregivers perform heroic, life-saving acts every day. And in the face of the unexpected, they can be depended upon to rise to the needs of their respective uh, communities. I appreciate the opportunity and we'll look forward to answering questions. Thank you thank very you. much. Dr. Carol Sherrod. Dr. Sherrod, thank you for being with us. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and committee members. It's an honor to come before you this morning to participate. Let's move the, uh, it'll be more of an honor if we can hear you. There we okay. go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Carl. Thank you. It's an honor to be here this morning to participate in the discussion on the response and information dissemination capabilities of our nation's public health system to a bioterrorism threat or incident. I'm Dr. Carol Sherrod, a preventive medicine public health physician and the health director for the Fairfax County Health Department. As the threats of bioterrorism became a reality, our nation's public health system had to take the lead in protecting the population from disease. The recently rapidly evolving anthrax crisis challenged our ability to respond to new threats and to communicate quickly and effectively. By virtue of the size and capabilities of the Fairfax Health Department, we assumed, assumed the leadership role among the health departments in the Northern Virginia region. In collaboration with the Virginia Department of Health, VDH, and the Arlington and Alexandria Health Districts, we operated a health assessment and treatment clinic for residents of Fairfax, Arlington, and Alexandria who were potentially exposed to anthrax at their work site. The Fairfax County Health Department routinely collects information on reportable communicable diseases. Uh, other time-sensitive public health data, including health alerts, guidelines, and protocols are received through email, fax, and the internet. 
During the anthrax crisis, communication between our health department and the state was hampered by temporarily inoperable email systems at both the state and county level. As you recall, this was about the time of the NIMDA virus, and Fairfax was hit hard by that. We therefore had to rely on an already overtaxed fax system to collect and disseminate information. The Inova Health Systems Disease, excuse me, Disaster Support Center gave invaluable assistance to the health department by cooperatively preparing anthrax-related information to blast facts to all medical care providers, including hospitals in the Northern Virginia region. We also provided anthrax information through the Fairfax County website with linkage to the Inova Health Systems, VDH, and the CDC. On October 12th, the Fairfax Health Department, through partnerships with the medical community, state health departments, and the CDC, put in an enhanced disease surveillance system into operation. Uh, this has been gone on, or has been explained before, so I won't go into that. Um, Real-time information sharing occurred by the health department, participating in daily conference calls with VDH, the Northern Virginia Health Departments. Uh, another call was with the District of Columbia Hospital Association, which had representatives from all of the metropolitan area hospitals, Council of Governments, the local and state health departments in Maryland, Virginia, and D.C. And also we had a daily conference call with the Fairfax County Emergency Management Coordinating Committee, which consists of 25 county agencies that have responsibility for emergency preparedness. The anthrax crisis, as has been said before, was uncharted territory. Few health care providers had ever seen anthrax, and with its high fatality rate, they grew increasingly concerned about potentially missing a diagnosis. We received urgent requests from doctors asking what to do with the growing number of people who were demanding <coughs> testing for potential exposures and what we would recommend for diagnostic procedures and post-exposure prophylaxis. Initially, the lack of CDC guidelines created both anxiety and inconsistency in patient care. Local medical providers and laboratory and hospital emergency staff were all clamoring for information. Although CD staff were working at DC General and the other area hospitals which were treating anthrax patients, their focus was primarily an epidemiological investigation. As a result, the release of information to the state and local health departments was slow, often with relevant information being first reported on Fox Channel 5 or CNN. We quickly set up a telephone information line to respond to the community's concerns. Calls from the public began right after the anthrax case in Florida was diagnosed, and the numbers increased dramatically after the Daschle letter on October the 15th. Our public health nurses were trained to answer citizens' calls regarding anthrax, small, smallpox, suspicious packages, and bioterrorism in general, and they operated our health department anthrax information line from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. This was seven days a week. Between October the 20th and November the 16th, we received over 200 calls per day with 400 at the height of the crisis. Some of these calls came from as far away as England and Germany. We communicated with the public using anthrax and bioterrorism updates on the Fairfax County website and cable television station, anthrax fact sheets, town meetings on emergency preparedness, news releases, press conferences, and local media interviews. The media helped in publicizing the anthrax information line number as well as getting the word out on the regional anthrax health assessment and treatment clinic status. The media reported much information before state or local health departments were made aware of it by the CDC. An example was the change from Cipro to doxycycline for post-exposure prophylaxis. It became necessary for our communicable disease program staff to listen to NPR, CNN, and read the Washington Post prior to reporting to work. Our anthrax information line was affected by the story of the day requiring additional, additional nurses on the phones to handle the flood of calls after evening news broadcast. The media occasionally reported inappropriate advice from television medical consultants as to which individuals needed treatment and test based on potential exposure at work sites. The CDC formal guidelines arrived later with the public near panic levels in the interim. Once again, the local emergency rooms, health care providers, and health departments were faced with citizens demanding unwarranted treatment utilizing scarce resources which should have been conserved for those who were indeed at risk. An example of media reporting that hampered the ability of the health department to adequately respond to the public involved nasal swab testing. The media reported that the nasal swab was the test for anthrax, when in fact CDC was using it as an environmental ep epidemiological tool. 
Individuals flooded local emergency rooms, urgent care centers, and other uh, care providers. However, the nasal swab was of no use in determining whether an individual required prophylaxis or treatment. Nasal swab testing only overtaxed medical and laboratory resources, diverting them from medical care that was required during the anthrax crisis. I notice I'm out of time. I'll just jump ahead since you all have this. I'll just go on to the... the yeah, your entire statement's in the record, so... You okay. I'll go on to the, the conclusion. Um, in conclusion, the CDC is to be complimented on their prompt epidemiological response to the anthrax crisis. And once medical information was released, it was, ex it was excellent and extremely useful. Not having a clear understanding of who ultimately was in charge of the unfolding crisis was, I believe, the major reason communication was delayed. The health of the public can be, can be preserved optimally in the event of a biological attack only with a strong, clear communication leadership role by the CDC. Controlling the panic that naturally occurs in such a crisis is a primary role of public health. I believe the public would have been better served had the CDC given daily updates on national television to the public and to the medical care providers. Despite our perceptions, the anthrax crisis unfolded relatively slowly. But had this been smallpox instead of anthrax, our slow transmission of information would have been devastating with rapid spread of the disease and increased mortality. The cooperation and collaboration on the local level was extraordinary with everyone involved providing service to the point of exhaustion, as I am sure was true throughout the region and also for VDH and CDC employees. To effectively respond to future crises, it is evident that local, state, and national public health agencies need additional funding for personnel, training, equipment, supplies, and systems development. Our current capabilities will not adequately protect the public. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Dr. Saunders? Thanks. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the, of the uh, committee, thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to address <coughs> this group. Oh, uh, sorry. I'd like to uh, speak to you today from a couple of perspectives. The first is, as a businessman uh, and uh, president of uh, EDS, Healthcare Global Industry Group, a company involved with large-scale information technology uh, services. The second, though, is as a physician with a long career in disaster management, uh, having served, for example, uh, for many years as a medical director of the city and county of San Francisco's uh, Department of Public Health uh, Paramedic Division and 911 Medical Response. I've been involved in many disasters and multi-casualty events, uh, events, including uh, managing the uh, medical response to the Loma Prieta earthquake. Uh, also, on September 11th, I was at the World Trade Center when the first plane hit, and I spent the duration of that event uh, participating uh, in that incident, including providing emergency medical care to, uh, to victims at the scene. So I do have some unique perspectives, I think, both from a practical standpoint and also from an IT perspective. First of all, a couple of lessons learned. Uh, number one, and uh, you know, the, the first thing I'd have to say is I'm always in awe of the American spirit and the resilience and the courage and the compassion uh, and the initiative that individuals take under these, um, these times. And I'm, I'm proud to be an American. Uh, and that, that needs to, can't go without saying. But the second thing is that uh, disaster, organized disaster plans are, are, uh, are nothing more than educated guesses at the hand you'll be dealt. And oftentimes it's different. And the key to success is fluidity and adaptability of the response. And the key to success there is information and communications. And this is exactly where our public health system falls down. Uh, emergency care workers uh, have uh, no method for providing information uh, in real time uh, about what's happening from minute to minute in their healthcare environment. So the surveillance information that's real time is lacking. There's no method for rapid dissemination of that information, not only about bioterrorism, but hazmat incidents. And in fact, at two o'clock in the morning, if I have a child bit by a dog, I don't know if there's rabies in my community because there's no easy way to access that information at the point of care. Um, there's no effective and reliable way to keep your pulse on the uh, status of our uh, health care capacity, bed capacity, the ambulance distributions, the availability of uh, health care personnel and materiel. Um, <clears throat> and uh, finally, health care workers are unprepared to deal with <coughs> rare but critical events, bioterrorism, hazmat uh, materials, things that they see rarely uh, and perhaps hear about once in medical school but aren't prepared uh, for those incidents. 
EDS supports the recommendations of the uh, CDC and the uh, uh, eHealth initiative. In fact, I'm on the leadership council of that group. Uh, we support the recommendations for a web-based system for, for real-time surveillance, including linkage to relevant information systems at the point of care. We also support a mechanism for rapid dissemination of information outbound to healthcare workers. But I would further add that we can build on that with some additional things to keep in mind uh, that would be of benefit. Uh, number one is uh, uh, a very effective uh, method for web-based distance learning at the point of care at the time that it's relevant when care is being delivered uh, so that healthcare workers can understand um, uh, how to treat these victims that, occur that uh, present. Another is uh, a mechanism for event tracking uh, of uh, both victims uh, and the impact. At the Loma Prieta earthquake, uh, we, my colleagues and I published a study of the impact of that, and it took months of research combing through ER log records to find out, in fact, uh, in fact how many casualties there were and what the distribution was. And that's too late to be effective for uh, decision making. Uh, another capabilities for monitoring and uh, allocating uh, health care resources so we don't have 200 physicians showing up uh, at a hospital <coughs> to take care of victims who all happen to be across town. And then finally, uh, security hardening of our information infrastructure for health care information. That means uh, redundant uh, systems, hot backups, hardened facilities. There will be challenges in the implementation of this. Uh, first of all, development, maintenance, maintenance of the applications and the content. Uh, secondly, integration to the relevant systems in the care environment, whether it's lab systems or the uh, uh, hospital information systems, the registration logs and so forth will be difficult. Uh, it will be time consuming and it will be complex and there will be maintenance required on those interfaces. The education and training of healthcare workers so that we understand how to interface with those systems and how to extract value from them uh, will be a challenge. The policies around privacy and security and access to that information, who's appropriate, who's authorized and when. And then the business process changes. Uh, we have to learn that instead of mailing in a three by five card to report a, a reportable event, uh, now we go online to, uh, to provide information. So success in conclusion is uh, based on, will be based on an effective partnership uh, between the public uh, as well as the private sectors of healthcare as well as the information technology business community. Um, I think that when these occur, and it will be a journey, uh, it will be a great ben benefit to us all, and I thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much, and thank all of you for your testimony. We have a number of questions, and I'm going to begin with Mr. Shays, who has uh, belatedly joined our panel from uh, Occoquan, I guess you're coming down in traffic. Thank you for being here. Chris, you've worked a lot of this on your other subcommittees, and we appreciate you being here today. Mr. Chairman, I'm very grateful that you're holding this hearing, and. Uh, I thank you for putting together such an excellent panel. I have an opening statement which I'd like included in the record and would just ask uh, my, uh, I would first. That objection, sir. Thank you. I, I, in regards to the public health infrastructure, the status report that we're discussing today, I want to just read one, one paragraph uh, that I just think uh, says a lot to me and it's on page eight and says, as with the workforce demands on our nation's Public health information infrastructure has never uh, been greater. Today, global travel, immigration, and commerce can move microbes and disease vectors around the world at jet speed, yet our public health surveillance systems still rely in many cases on time-consuming, resource-intense Pony Express system of paper-based reporting and telephone calls. I, um, I, I think that our world uh, is under tremendous threat. Uh, our country is. We, we basically have to protect ourselves from a lot of pathogens, uh, just as we would protect ourselves from individuals or, or armies that, that might invade us. And the first issue I want to focus in on is the, just the whole issue of monitoring. I'm led to believe, but I don't know if this is true, that we are in our, um, because I'm told it is, and then I find when people respond to my questions that they're not doing it. Are we monitoring uh, every major urban area's hospital every day, requiring them to give us uh, b the potential outbreaks that they might be encountering? Um, so are we getting a handle on uh, a potential outbreak? Because obviously, if we do, then we have a a, a more easier time to respond. I'd throw it out to the panel and whoever would like to respond to first uh, would I'd be welcome to. Could we perhaps, uh, doctor with you, uh, Dr. Sherritt? We do do that daily with all of the hospitals. In you want to use your mic? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
Yes, sir. We do do that daily. Uh, and you're right, it is labor intensive, but all hospital uh, emer emergency room visits uh, in the intensive care units, all of that is monitored. We do it not only for diseases, but for disease syndromes, so that any time there's any indication of uh, something that would uh, cause you to, to suspect that there is uh, a potential uh, for any bioterrorism agent, then that so would be defined me we though is it we every hospital through their uh, their their public health director or who is we <coughs> we the health department uh, in cooperation with the hospitals we you call we, them up every day do you say what's your count or do they call you uh, if you don't we, get a we physically have a nurse that is in every hospital every morning or else uh, in touch with the hospital every morning. But if there's something that we think needs uh, specifically going over, we will go to the hospital and go to the record. But we, we get that information every day. Mr. Regan, we, uh, do I say it correctly, Regan? Okay. Among this panel, I hope you realize you are first among equals. You, 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 um, uh, hats off to you and the state for how uh, you dealt with the West Nile virus. Do you get involved in this issue of, uh, of um, being aware of reporting, or do you only hear about it if there may be a particular problem? I get involved with it, uh, particularly w with working with our commissioner at the Department of Public Health, who again has outreach to the uh, local uh, hospitals and local communities. Uh, again, as the a provider of the inf information technology infrastructure, uh, anytime there's a requirement for disseminating information through that infrastructure, uh, I'm hand in hand with the, uh, the uh, public health commissioner. When we, um, we did a, um, <coughs> a tabletop exercise in Connecticut, and they do it in other areas, and where we, in this case, we had a practice where all the communities were involved, the state and the federal government, and it was a chemical outbreak on an on, uh, in a, um, an Amtrak train. Uh, the thing that amazed me most was the uh, when we got all done, the firemen knew what they intuitively should do. The policemen, we learned that they were the canary in the, in the, uh, in the coal mine. Uh, and that was a shock to them, too, to, to realize the hit. But the one thing that stood out the most to me was the health people, and the, the, the hospitals, uh, our health directors, they were the ones who were just kind of in left field, not because, in other words, they knew how to treat and they knew how to handle, but they were treated like um, the stepchild, uh, with no disrespect to stepchildren. Uh, but, but in other words, they were not given the kind of uh, respect and attention they should get. Uh, communication was by one you know, phone that might not work. Uh, their systems didn't coordinate with the fire and police. Are we finding that's uh, the case in other places besides Connecticut? Could someone speak oh, to that? From, 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 from Nagel's perspective, uh, Congressman, there is a enormous need to improve the uniformity and of capability and capacity throughout the country for doing the kinds of things that you're talking about. For instance, in our three uh, centers for public health preparedness, one in DeKalb County, Rochester, New York, and, and Denver, uh, even in those places that have been working at this for a couple years, there are needs for improving the, just exactly what you, what you talk about. So uh, there is a, uh, there's an infrastructure improvement that is absolutely necessary. And the kind of uh, description that you provide for it is, is, is in the context uh, absolutely correct. I want to emphasize one piece, at least from our experience in DeKalb County, is that we, we take a view to this that we ought to be better prepared every day. And I'm sure that's true in each health department. And so we build on past uh, successes. Uh, we actually prepared for the Olympics. Uh, and we had syndromic surveillance uh, within our hospitals in 1996 around heat-related illness and uh, working with the state around uh, in, uh, foodborne illness possibilities. Then almost all of the local health departments in the country, to one degree or another, worked on the Y2K problem. And we have, and then of course when we, when the East Coast in particular experienced the West Nile virus. Uh, uh, presence. We worked with our hospitals to set up <coughs> syndromic surveillance related to that particular effort. Uh, but it must, it must be much more uniform, and the investment for, in both the technology and in the workforce is absolutely critical. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Colbert, give us uh, your assessment of the preparedness of America's hospitals to deal with uh, infectious, contagious diseases that come to the emergency rooms of those hospitals. Uh, I've often had the fear that a lot of hospitals would just be closed down if we had somebody walk in with smallpox, and that would be the end of health care for that community. Are they better prepared than I understand them to be? Um, to answer your question uh, directly, I think we're getting better prepared. Uh, I, I would tell you that, uh, that I've had some of the same issues myself uh, in the past in looking and in, in gearing up, and I think that we are today. Um, not only from an infection control standpoint, uh, but also in caring for patients. However, let me also say that in terms of the actual infrastructure that might be required, uh, let's say if a smallpox, an individual presented themselves with smallpox, and the ability to isolate that patient and then care for them, I think that's going to be a challenge for many hospitals, and it's one of the issues that we say ourselves that we're going to have to do a better job of uh, physically gearing up for. Uh, do we have uh, medical capabilities and strong infection control programs, the answer is absolutely yes, and I'm confident in that regard. But the, the key is putting these other pieces in place to be able to isolate and then support uh, in care of those patients. And I, I gather that the uh, larger, more urban hospitals would be better prepared to deal with that than many of our rural hospitals? Um, I think that would be a, a, a fair statement only because of the uh, resources that are generally made available in those kinds of uh, settings. It does not mean that there are not some strong, and as you would know from, uh, from Texas, some strong regional uh, rural institutions. But I would, I would answer your question by saying yes, uh, those institutions um, that normally would deal with these kinds of issues every day uh, are going to be significantly better prepared in responding to the unusual kinds of, of, uh, of uh, biological uh, agents that we might be seeing. A lot of the traditional infection, the flu, the other uh, uh, things that we would uh, see, uh, hospitals are prepared and do respond every day in that regard. Uh, Mr. Reagan, I think Mr. Shays uh, is not with us, but I, I was curious. You, you made reference to uh, the 90-year-old lady who contracted anthrax and died, and that it was suspected that that uh, that she contracted it because of cross contamination of the mail. Was that ever was that ever verified, and was the path of that of her mail uh, traced to the extent that it would could have been determined whether it crossed the path of the letters that were sent here from New Jersey to Washington, um, or was that just speculation? I think it uh, was not uh, confirmed 100 percent, but there was a high probability that there was uh, cross-contamination in that case, but uh, could not be uh, by the facts derived at, um, at the home. I don't think they could actually prove that, uh, that they found any anthrax at her home. Was there an effort uh, actually to track the path of that, of the mail that goes to to her residence uh, to see if it went through locations where the, the uh, letters that arrived here in Washington also may have traveled? Uh, absolutely. And in fact, they were able to establish that there was some cross-contamination through one of the processing centers in Connecticut uh, from some of the mail from New Jersey. And I think that's where they suspect that there may have been the cross-contamination that ended up at her house. But they were never, never able to substantially find enough uh, uh, evidence at the house to uh, make, that, make that case. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Horn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we're all talking in somewhat the same manner because it's uh, an involvement of information and uh, getting involvement of the bureaucracies that you face in counties and states. Uh, we have an excellent FEMA operation at the federal level, in my judgment. And um, most of the governors are very good at the Office of Emergency Management. And uh, certainly there's been a major role for chief information officers that we didn't have uh, 10 years ago. Uh, I'd be curious with the following situation. I come from uh, Los Angeles County, 10 million people, 83 cities, and uh, the sheriff there and uh, the surrounding suburbs, which is another 10 million from San Diego to Santa Barbara. And uh, that uh, has been done with pacts, compacts, 
and um, information uh, in terms of telephone use, uh, radio, all the rest. And sometimes when they have exercise, we find, uh, let's say a few years ago, the communications were all on the East Coast in terms of their uh, radio uh, frequency. And uh, that uh, sort of gave the West a very difficult situation. So I'm curious in terms of the following. We do have a law that trucks that go across the country have what chemicals are in that. So if something happens, a fire department knows what they're dealing with. The same with facilities in most jurisdictions. Everybody sort of knows. And uh, in our case with uh, earthquakes, well, you never know when that's going to come. And it isn't uh, easy. So I'm curious what the CIOs feel and uh, the epidemiologists uh, do with uh, finding the information and spreading it to the right people at the right time. How do you feel about that since you're all association leaders uh, that are looking at it from a U United States uh, 50 state situation, not just your home situation, but you represent both. So I'm curious, Mr. Reagan, uh, how do, do you feel that uh, the CIO situation is uh, well represented, or are there places still in the country where they can't seem to get their computing going? I think, uh, again, representing the uh, CIOs, uh, certainly um, it is a relatively uh, new position in states over the last uh, five to six years. And I think what uh, the, our association has found out, and as, the, uh, as is the case in Connecticut, those CIOs that are at cabinet, cabinet level, level that report directly to the governor that have enterprise responsibility for infrastructures that cross many uh, governmental functions. Again, I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor and I don't necessarily have a stake in public health, but I provide services to public health. I provide services to public safety, uh, transportation, labor, uh, Department of Banking, and all spectrums of government. So I think that, uh, again, uh, CIOs, um, and it's more predominant now than it has been ever, that have, uh, again, a seat at the table with the governors, with the uh, cabinet, uh, other cabinet officials uh, that can look from a broad perspective to deal with these mu the multitude of issues and look for, again, uh, effective and efficient solutions that cross that spectrum. And again, looks across the horizontal uh, is where um, state CIOs have been uh, very uh, effective. Um, the issue that you brought up in the uh, uh, frequency spectrum, I, uh, I'm surprised because uh, we have the situation in Connecticut. I thought it was the West Coast that had all the, the frequencies because it certainly uh, has been a challenge. And when 9-11 when, when happened, uh, there was some issues in terms of communication on the, uh, the wireless systems across the local uh, and uh, state police uh, systems, uh, particularly in Fairfield County, which was, again, uh, the, the doorway to New York City from Connecticut. Have uh, the CIOs looked at the 911 situation nationwide? And if so, what are they? And should uh, we and you be uh, looking at the FCC to see what can be done? We, we certainly uh, have. In fact, a, a month ago at this uh, time, the CIOs met in Washington to uh, essentially focus on uh, security and critical infra infrastructure protection. Uh, one of the components of that, again, is the ability to communicate the wireless uh, was not, again, the fo uh, focal point, but we looked at all the considerations of how states need to coordinate our activities better, who do we coordinate with the, uh, with the federal government, and it, 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 it has been unclear, I think, with the appointment of Richard Clark, who works in the uh, Office of Homeland Security and Cyber, Ter uh, cyber Security and Terrorism, uh, it's starting to become more clear, but it still is uh, very uh, uh, sometimes frustrating to find an answer when you're dealing with our federal counterparts. Uh, the states seem to uh, have it together. We seem to be able to communicate very effectively. We're putting uh, processes and plans in place uh, to do just that. And again, I think what our hope is, is to be able to come provide uh, some recommendations to, uh, to the Congress to help uh, structure the way, again, we communicate with some of the federal uh, jurisdictions in this area. Now, your information can go pretty rapidly to rural parts of our states. Uh, but in terms of epidemiologists, uh, Dr. Pizzino, is uh, not so easy. And the question would be, if they don't have laboratories in the part of the state, let's say Wyoming, even California, 
part of it is rural and uh, uh, the Utah, Arizona, so forth. Uh, are there kits or something that can be put together where uh, either using a high school chemistry lab or biological lab and see if certain cases uh, with the local hospital or they, if they have a local hospital, and sometimes they're 200 miles away, uh, even though they're, some of them are veterans hospitals and uh, state hospitals. How do you feel about that in terms of what we could do on the spot to do it with a kit? Well, obviously, um, Congressman, we all wish that we had a magic test that could be used on the spot and give us within a few seconds the answer that we all want. Is this a real threat or not? Uh, I'm firmly convinced that ruling out false threats is as important as recognizing true threats. Uh, unfortunately, that's not available. And uh, um, there is a lot of people at work um, doing research in very advanced stage, and, and some kids look very promising. But right now, there is really nothing that can assure us that uh, something found on the spot is or is not a threat. Um, I think when you're talking about laboratories, things look a little better, because one of the purposes of the bioterrorism initiative that was funded through CDC and other sources is to create a laboratory network that reaches down to the local hospital level. And I can assure that that is happening, it has happened, it has been tested in the last two months and is working. So most laboratory tests can be done in local hospitals and then if they are um, if they are not fully negative, then they will have to be sent to a reference hospital, which is usually the state health department laboratory, public health laboratory. Uh, but at least they are able to rule out uh, what is not a threat. Uh, I, I also mm, totally agree with Mr. Regan's assessment. I, I think communication within the state uh, and, and within the state government is actually not as problematic as communication among states and other federal partners and uh, uh, also communication with private partners. That's really one of the weak points that I have recognized also in my testimony. I really think that that's where we have to put a lot of efforts because I have no problem at this point in reaching out to my hospitals in my state or my local health departments. My challenge is how to reach out to the physicians who are on the front line of this war. Uh, Mr. Wiesner, you represent the uh, county and uh, city health officials and Mr. Covert, you represent the American Hospital Association. As I recall, there's accreditation standards for various hospitals. Is that most hospitals have that, or are there some that aren't up to the accreditation? In response uh, to your question, uh, Congressman, uh, most hospitals, almost all, have accreditations. Um, and you're referring to the acute care, but also in terms of, uh, of a number of other uh, specialty hospitals as well. There's very few uh, that are not accredited or do not choose to go through that. And remember, all of them are required um, through uh, our, our HHS to have some level of accreditation uh, in order to be able to, uh, to uh, receive Medicare funding. Well, some of the things we've all talked about, uh, would it be right that the next go around we have certain questions for accreditation? And if so, what have you learned to put in? Uh, let me share that with you. That is actually an issue right now that I know that uh, the American Hospital Association and the Joint Commission is actually looking at and to establish a task force that will look through to ask those questions as you go through that accreditation process in order to be able to respond to the issues uh, that you're raising. Um, and I think that uh, I think hospitals will do well um, as they're gearing up and, and moving forward. But uh, in answer to your question, yes, that is happening right now. Uh, my subcommittee has jurisdiction over the federalism of the country, and uh, one of the things we're having the uh, General Accounting Office do is look at some of the radiation situation that could be breaking loose, the biological, the chemical, and uh, the water supply. That's all over the United States, and uh, if we have these nuts running loose, uh, we need to do something besides just a fence around the reservoir and uh, what happens when something happens to the water supply. Are any of your uh, committees within your associations that are looking at that? Um, in terms of each of these uh, respective areas, I think they're now beginning that process of, of, of gearing up. There have always been uh, accreditation 
um, standards and licensure requirements for us to meet um, and to uh, to uh, respond to. So at that, that first basic level, uh, let me give you a level of comfort that it's there. However, in terms of taking those additional steps and how we prepare and then secure, and how would you deal with the effects of, uh, of a contaminated water supply, as an example, as you brought up, or changes in power supply that we'd have to respond to. Um, I think hospitals now, as part of their disaster planning, are actually doing that on an individual basis, uh, um, not just simply what's happening at the, uh, at the national level. And I think that you will see in the next um, year as we're going through this uh, process, um, either accreditation requirements or standards um, expected of, of respective institutions and how you respond to those issues and how you tie that into the entire, obviously, public health uh, setting that we look to. Does uh, every hospital in the United States have a uh, temporary uh, energy supply based on diesel or whatever to keep the lights going and all the rest of the things? Um, all hospitals are, are required, and you'll see this at the state level as well as from the accreditation requirements about having emergency backup and supplies to be able to support your OR or your emergency room and to have a certain level or extent of, uh, of supply, whether that uh, is uh, appropriate backup uh, generators, whether that's oil or gas, uh, inclusions of as associated with uh, water, um, to be able to uh, respond if you needed to for a period of time. I think the challenge comes uh, for us is when it becomes an extended period of time then uh, that you might see from some kind of biological attack or situation that you have to respond to that I think is going to be a challenge that we need to plan for and that uh, I think it's one of the areas that the uh, hospital association has commented on. Uh, part of the costs associated with this is building that uh, uh, infrastructure, which doesn't exist uh, today, uh, beyond that very short-term capacity. And that's why you see then requests for significant numbers of dollars for individual hospitals to be able to respond uh, to that uh, question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Warren, thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate the witnesses here. Great group. I got it. Technical question, probably everybody understands the room but me, but I'm going to ask it. Um, <laughs> Rock, I'll ask you just because you're CIO. C CDC initiative like Han or NEDS uh, are web-based. So if, if you use the existing infrastructure uh, for these initiatives, what's the chance of a typical spike in web usage at a time of an emergency would render these systems unusable just because you'd have a, a capacity issue? I think as, uh, as we look at uh, architecting these systems, that uh, certainly is a critical element of how do you look at the spikes, particularly when you need it the most. So um, we as um, information technology professionals do this every day. Uh, it's the same requirements for uh, public safety. Uh, again, if you uh, have a public safety event, uh, you want to make sure that you have the capacity, uh, the ability to have capacity. And we've seen how cell phones fail that yes, time. Yes, absolutely. I think that is, that's a primary example. I think from, uh, from an architectural standpoint, some of the things that we look at is uh, shutting down traffic that is not uh, important traffic uh, on a network. Uh, so as a, for instance, if you were to have uh, uh, other requests from other agencies like uh, regulatory agencies in, in the event of a da disaster, we would actually shut those parts of the network down to uh, essentially guarantee uh, network availability and system availability for those that need the information and need it now. I see. Um, Brock, why I've got you in a couple of the questions. I was under the impression that CDC had sought substantial input uh, from states and localities when they were developing the Han and, and the NEDS uh, uh, standards. Is, is it your point that the outreach might have extended to health officials but not the CIOs? Uh, I think that's exactly our point, is that a lot of the information that we're talking about here doesn't necessarily go di uh, directly to um, health officials. That, again, there are other elements in government that have to have the uh, information available to them at the right point in time. Again, as CIOs, we provide services to uh, cross-spectrum of government. So when we look at uh, creating these standards, um, while they're, I'm sure, in fact, I know they're very good standards, uh, they are, in fact, to some degree, stovepipe standards in this, uh, in this um, uh, element. Uh, we uh, certainly would like to look across the spectrum uh, in other uh, instances where we have standards in, ter in terms of how they fit. Okay. Uh, Dr. Pizzino, several states have not yet signed on to implementing NEDS. Um, how widespread is acceptance in the public health care community uh, uh, is, is the NEDS architecture? And do you suggest uh, to see, see anything they can do to obtain more widespread acceptance? 
Well, I think that actually most states have accepted the, the, the NEDS architecture as, a, um, as an important step towards standardization. Certainly, I would say all states recognize the need for standardization. The main issue when it comes to implementation is honestly funding. And, and uh, unfortunately, um, there were uh, only a few states that were funded when their applications for funds was turned into the CDC. And there were at least 25 states that applied for NEDS money last year and didn't get any funding because of lack of money. So I think what you are seeing is not so much a result of a lack of motivation, but more a lack of funding. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. How extensively are the EPI-6 updates available through mobile communication devices? Uh, the CDC indicated that EPI-6 uh, uh, experienced uh, significant challenges on September 11th uh, because many state uh, you know, health uh, officials were uh, free, were, they were forced to evacuate their offices and they didn't have plans in place uh, for off-site access. That is true. That is certainly one limitation of the system. And uh, uh, at present, there is absolutely no capability to make APX available for mobile devices. Um, another weakness of the APX project is that it doesn't allow uh, um, an easy communication between states and their local health departments. And that's why we are really strongly supporting an expansion of the APX project to include local health departments and to have somewhat state nodes of APX that can act almost as independent parts of one bigger picture. Um, again, I, I'm afraid I have to go back to the previous issue of funding. Um, the APX project has received very little, no funding at all, actually. There was never, uh, to my knowledge, any funding from the Congress. Same thing. We ask you to do more with the same amount of money. Exactly, the exactly. There was no dedicated funding for APX. It was done with intramural money the CDC was able to, to mobilize. Okay. Dr. Wiesner, let me ask this. What's the status of the core capacities for bioterrorism preparedness uh, for local public health systems? Well, I think uh, that, that, uh, that's an important question because the uh, capacity measures are actually part of a, a broader effort of, of uh, measuring the performance of infrastructure. And uh, it's actually linked to the earlier question of uh, being able to move uh, health departments to some form of voluntary or, or formal accreditation. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the situation as far as the specific uh, performance uh, indicators uh, for bioterrorism is that a, uh, a continuing assessment is occurring and uh, there, are, there are just large areas for improvement, some of which we've incorporated into the testimony that you've heard earlier or, or the written testimony. Okay. HIPAA has mandated certain information sharing and security standards for health care. Do you feel there is a need uh, for a similar regulation within the public health, uh, within public health that not only mandates standardization across public health but also ties back to uniform standards with health care? Well, I think uh, to the degree that, uh, that local health departments are engaged in provision of personal services, uh, we, we are already subjected to the to the HIPAA regulation, and our experience with the current uh, uh, the current threats that we're talking about really does uh, beg for at least a reexamination or looking carefully at the HIPAA regulation. Okay. With regard to the uh, importance of being able to receive uh, a real-time syndromic surveillance for the protection of uh, of uh, of, of the community for bioterrorism threats, uh, we, we, we believe that we have the current authority to receive those with the, with the HIPAA regulations as they are presently stated. Okay. Mr. Covert, will you agree with that? Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I would, and I would uh, also add that I think it's going to be a tremendous uh, challenge for us. Uh, but we're not just dealing with issues of, uh, of consent forms. We're also talking about uh, that transmission of that information, oftentimes as it would relate to an individual patient as you then aggregate that data to use it. And uh, if you look at the regulations today, there's some question about our abilities to be able to do that. And I guess I should make one other comment. It's not that, that we um, uh, have a problem with issues of privacy or confidentiality whatsoever. But when the regulations themselves and then the, uh, the paperwork and the bureaucracy that goes with it actually truly get in the way of caring for patients real time, then that's a challenge for us uh, to, uh, to address. So I think that, uh, and as I've shared with the, uh, uh, the regulatory uh, uh, task force staff 
folks, uh, Christine Schmidt, uh, who's going to chair Secretary Thompson's task force, is that we need better guidance, better clarification on those guidelines um, so that we can apply them appropriately, um, not just in the event of, a, of an attack uh, as a result of a bioterrorism, but uh, every day. Uh, the dollars that we're talking about spending, um, even at the hospital center alone, just to comply with regulations of several millions of dollars, not even related to the issues that we're here talking about today, uh, from an infrastructure standpoint, from an information system standpoint, is going to be significantly greater. So I think it's going to be a challenge, and I would agree with Dr. Dr. Wiesner. Good enough. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, Dr. Sherrill, let me ask you. In your statement, you noted that the County Health Department in Fairfax lacks the ability to seamlessly connect the local, state, and federal data systems, as well as the capacity to send and receive confidential, confidential health information and to broadcast health alerts. Uh, what initiatives do you see the Commonwealth of Virginia doing to improve that situation? You know what I'm talking about? Yes, I know what you're okay. talking about. Um, I think that's a difficult question because it, it, it uh, goes into the confidentiality issue. Yeah. And um, again, I think we need new systems that are secure and, you know, funding to acquire those new systems. And I don't know uh, in um, relation to privacy in, when you have a, a national emergency that perhaps some of that would have to it's be relaxed. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think in your testimony you noted that the that an important communication was delayed because there wasn't a clear understanding of who was in charge. Yes. Um, to your knowledge, have you seen any changes that have been made to address the problem from where you sit? I don't. I, I guess I'm not aware of that. I from from where. It almost take another emergency to find out. Well, other people may know. I must say I do not know that. Uh, one of the problems that that we had was, uh, you know, relating to communicating with the post office, and uh, you know how how you crossed from. Uh, CDC recommendations to implementation within the in the post office, uh, and having someone directly in charge of all of that was an issue, and uh, I don't know if that has I can't say that that has been resolved. Okay, thank you. I'll turn to Dr. Saunders for a minute. EDS's recommendations for mitigating terrorism seem really far-reaching and and, uh, and and I would say forward-thinking. Um, but fully implementing those recommendations would likely be cost costly and from a governmental perspective uh, probably uh, not feasible in the short term. Has EDS researched the cost and time required to implement these solutions? Uh, and and if, if, if you've given any thought, what would be your highest priority? Well, I think that, um, you know, I think I, I, I view that where we need to go as a journey rather than something that's going to be accomplished uh, next year. I think uh, it is important to have a vision in mind. As we overhaul our public health infrastructure, uh, you know, I would challenge us to think about uh, what the goals and vision are for the system that we want in the United States um, next year, five years, ten years, so that all of these are part of some logical plan, uh, number one. So I, I wouldn't say that, that the costs and the timelines are fully scoped out, but it's probably, you know, a five to ten year journey for a lot of these different components. I'd say that probably the highest priority would be the, the kinds of things that the eHealth initiative is focusing on, which um, uh, gets to uh, real-time surveillance of uh, critical reportable events. But it needs to be a two-way street for returning that information to, to care wor workers so that they can actually uh, make use of that information and make some impact in the care environment. That would be the highest priority, I think. Okay. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Turner. Uh, Mr. Saunders, one other item you mentioned in your statement is the uh, biometric human identification system. Uh, give us a little insight on the state of the art in uh, biometric human identification. Well, you know, it's, uh, EDS has been uh, involved in implementing biometric systems. For example, the, uh, the system, the biometric system in use at Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv, for example, was implemented by EDS. That involves uh, hand recognition, and there are other elements that uh, we've done in a couple of other places as well, including the face identification. Um, I, I mentioned that uh, that you're referring to because I think that the technology is evolving very rapidly, and there are ultimately some limitations to um, to biometrics that we know of. You know, the uh, 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 thumb and face uh, are not always uh, capturable in some circumstances uh, based on the, 
the uh, conditions in which those are captured. Uh, <clears throat> and oftentimes we have uh, people that need identification who can't communicate soft data elements uh, or maybe that uh, body parts and so forth have been damaged so that they can't really provide that biometric source. So I think at some point we're going to have to look at not this year, next year or so uh, in the future, how we incorporate uh, elements that are 100 percent gold standard like DNA information in selected circumstances, whether it's identification of body parts at the scene of the World Trade Center uh, or other types of things, uh, and then uh, the, the ability to link that to uh, law enforcement and terrorist databases. I mentioned uh, that because I think the opportunity to start thinking down the road of things like DNA data bank banking as a part of our biometric human identification system is, is something that we ought to look at. You are, of course, familiar with the, the uh, efforts of the CDC and the testimony today talked about three of their major initiatives. Do you see anything about those initiatives that you could offer suggestions for improvement? And are they consistent with moving to the next step, which seems to be uh, what you're talking about in your testimony? Is there anything that would be conflicting or inconsistent with that move? I think that there's nothing inconsistent. I think that those are good, good first steps. But um, I think the focus of, of this has been around bioterrorism. And as, a, as, a, as an emergency physician, I can tell you, you know, that's a tiny, tiny slice of the kinds of uh, problems that we deal with uh, every day that have a, a critical public health impact. There are also hazmat circumstances. There's multi-casualty incidents. There's tuberculosis and all those sorts of things that would benefit from the same kind of infrastructure, not just around bioterrorism. So that's one would be how can the scope of this be appropriately broadened to serve a greater uh, public health need if we're playing down this infrastructure? I think that would be an important issue. Um, the other, uh, the other issue I think uh, is going to, you know, the devil is in the details on these things, and I think that we're, we're, when we get into the, the actual challenge of uh, integration into uh, care systems, uh, we're going to find a lot of uh, very challenging issues. You know, the deal, the dealing with um, master person indexes and the, the multiple different ways that people, the same person is represented in different systems and resolving those challenges, maintaining interfaces to those systems, who's going to pay for it is going to be very difficult. So, uh, you know, the devil's in the details there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. I, um, I'd like to, um, we wrestled shortly after 9-11 as to what to tell people. Um, and it's amazing the quantum leap we've, we've come. I mean, shortly after, some of us were saying what we felt to be the truth, which was it's not a matter of if there'll be a chemical or biological attack. It's a question of when, where, and of what magnitude. And um, our view was you tell the American people the truth, and like adults, they'll tell you to do the right thing. Um, and our view was that people aren't going to realize this is a war unless you tell them why <laughs> it's a war. It's a war because we're in a race with the terrorists to shut them down before they uh, develop the, the delivery system for chemical or biological agents or, heaven forbid, get radioactive material in a dirty bomb or a nuclear weapon. So. That's why we're fighting this. What I want to ask you all is, um, how do you, besides this infrastructure that we want to develop, um, um, what kind of debates did you start to find uh, as we, as to who should disseminate this information and and who should have it and so on? And maybe, Mr. Reagan, I I could. Uh, I could ask you first. I mean, for instance, with anthrax, was it viewed that it was important that the governor be the one to talk about the woman who was inflicted in Oxford? Or the governor, the governor certainly certainly made that decision to be the right. focal point of disseminating the information. And again, uh, as part of that, he uh, clearly made it understood as to who uh, was going to deal with the communications at the local level. So it was the public health commissioner uh, and the governor who made that decision. The ba local, based the, on the information that came to them. The local health d director in the Oxford area? Oxford, as well as the uh, Commissioner of Public uh, Health for the State of Connecticut. Do you all get involved in any of these debates as to who should be uh, providing this information, or can you tell us any anecdotes as to how you're trying to resolve these issues? Uh, from, yeah. uh, uh, from NATO's perspective, the most important piece there is to actually have a plan for doing that ahead of time. And, uh, and that's one of the things that's occurred as a result of our starting in 1999 in DeKalb County with a plan. Intuitively, I, I could 
be able to tell you why I think you do that, but I'd like you to put it in your own words. Why, why was it important to be prepared to do that and know who would do it before the crisis occurred? Be because the public needs a credible spokesperson that has timely and accurate information. And I, one other related factor to that. So I just want to emphasize your point about not just being accurate, but it being timely as well. And, and one other factor about that, at the local health department level throughout the country, we have to increase our capacity of working with the media mm -hmm. and establishing those relationships at the local level. Uh, I was surprised uh, during the anthrax things where we didn't have anthrax in, in our area. The nearest case was 300 miles away, and we had significant media interaction around this. I had complete strangers that I didn't even know coming up to me and saying, Dr. Wiesner, I'm happy that you were on the television yes. because I've seen you before and I recognize uh, that what you were saying was useful in interest of, of, uh, of the health. That's the, what we call the local presence for public health in the community. And we really need to be sure that that's uniform. Now, that's a different level when you're speaking at the state and national level. I, re I remember very clearly a discussion with our public safety director on one of these round table, uh, tabletop exercises where we had public safety people, hospital people, private physicians, and somebody said, well, who's going to speak to the press? <laughs> and, they, uh, you know, as part of that exercise, and they look to the local health director in that particular scenario that we were dealing with. But the most important piece is that you have a plan beforehand and that you have incident command that includes communication and media uh, uh, um, uh, relationships in your plan. May the record note that Mr. Cobert has been nodding his head the whole time you've been speaking. I don't know if you want to add anything. Uh, Congressman, I would uh, I would agree with uh, with uh, Dr. Wiesner. The mic a little in front. I would agree with uh, Dr. Wiesner. Thank you. Uh, I know even from our own experiences internally, and obviously being in the middle of uh, D.C. and having the uh, press right there, the uh, the pressures that the institution faces to respond to the community. On the other hand, when you only have a piece of the larger information as to what's going on, you really need to look. You need to be able to look to the uh, to your public health leadership. Uh, to be able to provide not only to calm fears but to provide good information and accurate information as to what's happening. I think that's one of the things why I, I, I tried to emphasize in the testimony of incorporating hospitals literally into that infrastructure so that you have that group together and planning together and how you effectively uh, communicate because you should be able to look to your public health leadership. My biases, having been a former uh, health director, uh, you want to be able to to respond in an accurate and, and if I can only reinforce exactly what you said, in a timely way. And I think that was part of our frustration here during those early days was that ability to be able to put out information in a timely way. I would also make one other comment to you that I think becomes a challenge for this body as we walk through this is, is the issue of jurisdictional. I know you heard from uh, Dr. Sherrod and the issues in Northern Virginia. We had those exact same issues in Maryland. We had those exact same issues in D.C. And who was going to then represent exactly what was happening, again, using the term nation's capital area. I could take and apply that same situation, Congressman, to an area far away from here in, let's say, in the heartland. Um, what would I do if I was in the Quad Cities? or some other area along the way in terms of who would be in charge, for example, of, of trying to share that kind of information, particularly if it would be dealing with uh, the kind of threat that would, would expand over the boundaries that uh, Dr. Wiesner had talked about. So I would concur with you that, that there needs to be a better direction in that regard. I think we should be able to look to our public health leadership and that it does need to be planned uh, in advance. Uh, I think we could take sure. a lesson also to some extent from what we've learned from those um, um, entities, those uh, uh, settings where you see major um, disasters in the past, let's recall them uh, weather-related kinds of disasters, where they've learned to have to come together to be able to then respond. This is a different issue, but the same um, principles would apply. Just quickly, I, I'm not sure if I have a second more if I do, but um, uh, and maybe I'll get no answer here, but is there anyone in this panel that uh, would argue that um, not telling the, excuse me, I'll say in the positive, that telling the, the truth uh, in the long run ends up to be uh, um, essential, uh, and that being tempted to gloss it over, understate it, and so on, um, 
doesn't also doesn't end up to result in some problems in the future. In other words, is truth the best policy when it comes to uh, disclosing the public health care threat? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. A lot of nodding of heads for the. Thank you, recorder. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure, Mr. Horn. Mr. Chairman, I just want to say that I watched very closely what was done in the Washington area. Uh, the mayor, I thought, did an excellent job. And when people were sort of ducking some of the questions, he had the health authorities right there. And uh, I think since the mayor is well known through by his citizens, uh, that's one good way because he's very articulate. Well, thank you very much. This has been a lively discussion, and I appreciate uh, basic, all of the testimony and, and your follow-up answers uh, to the uh, questions that were posed to you. Before we close, I want to, again, thank everybody for attending the uh, oversight hearing today. I want to thank the witnesses. I want to thank uh, my counterpart, the Ranking Member Congressman Turner, and the other members for staying here and, and through the hearing and participating. I want to thank my staff again for organizing. I think it's been very productive. And uh, again, you'll have uh, if you, up to 10 days if you want to supplement anything you said, anything occurs to you, you want to get in the record, we'll be happy to do that. These proceedings are closed. C-SPAN, public affairs on television, radio.